Hi, everybody. This is Craig with Out on Film, and thank you for joining us for one of our Out on Film conversations. And today we are talking to Paul McCrane, who played Montgomery McNeil in the movie Fame, which we are celebrating the 40th anniversary um, with a drive-in. So 40, 40, 40th anniversary? That's not possible. I know it isn't possible. I, 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 yeah, I think it is, it's actually. a fake number. Thank uh, you. <laughs> But Four welcome, years, yes. Paul, welcome to Out on Film, and thank you for joining you. us. My pleasure. Um, so it was a shocking number for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think you guys are, were even born yet when the movie came out, is what I suspect. But uh, anyway, uh, nor were most of the people I suspect who are coming to see it. Anyway. Yeah. So when, when you think about that um, over the years, what does this movie mean to you? Oh, wow. Uh, that's that's a big question. I don't think we have enough time to cover all that. Um, it, you know, look, it was one of the first, um, I actually started working as an actor when I was 15. Um, I was 18 when we shot it. Uh, it was certainly obviously the first um, substantial role I had in, on film. Um, it was obviously a life changing event uh, for me. Um, it was terrifying uh, when we made it. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think, what can I say about it? Um, to, be, to try to be thoughtful for a second, um, you know, there, at, at the time, as you know, there weren't uh, an awful lot of gay characters on film that were, well, at all, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly not an awful lot that were, uh, were positive. Um, I've had uh, folks over the years have, take issue with certain uh, aspects of the character or the or the the way the character was presented um you know my some people would have preferred the character not be quite as fragile a character as uh, as he was um everybody has a right to that um but um i hope and i think based on what some people have told me over the years that it presented a sympathetic character who happened to be gay uh and so it wasn't made into um i hope it avoided tropes and stereotypes and presented a human being uh, that was um, accessible to people. That's what I hope. So, uh, and, I, and I'm glad that you said that because I, I will say I was a young 16 year old gay kid. All of us from drama club went to see fame, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was, and it was that we didn't see any, you know, very little, if any, positive portrayals of gay people yeah. on film. or Unfortunately, on, yes. Certainly on TV, not in 1980. Um, right. But especially our age, in our yeah. age group. Um, right. And, and, you know, Billy Crystal was probably the most mm, prominent. Yeah. Or playing the most prominent gay character right. in media at the time. Yeah. And, and so this was a character that we could all see ourselves in. Because like you said, mm -hmm. he, Montgomery's not defined solely by his being gay. Uh, right. He's fully realized. Uh, he's not the gay sidekick. Um, right. And you just didn't see that in 1980. Were you conscious that this role was uh, unlike others, even in, that, even in that same movie, that it would speak to us in that way? Were you conscious of that when you were doing it? You know, what I was conscious of as a very young person myself was just that in my life, I didn't see a lot of characters like this. Um, and so, um, you know, I can't say that I had a, uh, a, a, an encyclopedic knowledge of the, the breadth of film or at all, let alone uh, gay characters in film. But I knew that this was a character that wasn't commonly seen. I certainly hadn't seen many characters like this at that time. I don't know if I'd seen any. Um, not that there weren't obviously right. gay characters in the film. So, so um, yeah, it felt to me like it was something I hoped that was a, a character who was presented as very human. That was the target, I hope. Is that what drew you when you went to read for it? Is that what drew you to wanting to play Montgomery? Oh, um, let's be honest about things. As an 18-year-old actor, um, one uh, certainly the character uh, attracted me. I was interested in the character. I, I thought it was a very interesting thing. But I was a young actor looking to do any, uh, you know, I was auditioning for any and everything. I wouldn't have done things that I thought were in some way offensive or obscene or anything like that. But um, it's, 
I forgive me for saying that. I just sometimes actors, there are absolutely actors who make choices, career choices and things like that. But most actors and certainly most young actors are just trying to get a job. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it was a great, I've been working primarily in the theater before that, a little bit of uh, film and television work, but not much. And, um, you know, it was an audition. I had a friend who had auditioned for it and said, hey, you should go audition for this movie, Hot Lunch. It's got a bunch of kids in it. And so I did, <laughs> which was the working title of the movie. Right. So you were a bunch of theater kids in a movie about a bunch of theater kids. <laughs> what was it like for all of you at the time making this? I mean, what, what was the experience? It's really wild. You know, the very first day I shot on the film was the opening shot of the film, uh, uh, the, which is, you know, my character's audition for the movie. And so having not done a lot of film, my memory of it, it wasn't this close, but it felt to me, you may recall, it opens on a shot of Olivier, Olivier as um, 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 Othello and then pulls back and reveals me. First of all, having that association was way beyond. Anyway, so, but my memory of it, it wasn't quite this, was that the camera started right here next to me and then pulled back. I was terrified <laughs> is what I was. And uh, so fortunately, some of that nervousness played right into the moment for the character anyhow. Um, the way we, we shot it, it was largely divided up into the three departments, the drama department, music department, and dance department. So while I'm actually friends still with some of my fellow cast members, Lee Carreri and I are, are good friends and we actually lost touch and re recently reconnected. When we were shooting it, we were largely sort of segregated into our three departments. So I unfortunately didn't get to participate in a lot of the really exuberant stuff that all the dancers got to do and all that stuff that was so great and so much fun to watch and so much fun for them to do. Um, I only would sort of show up on some of those days when they were shooting and go, wow. And that was basically my experience of that. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so as has it surprised you that the movie has this longevity, a sustaining power that, I mean, people are really excited that we're showing this again. I mean, people are like, oh, that's really, great. Really, really excited. And um, I'm thrilled to hear that. And so it's, and we were really excited when we decided to do it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, it's amazing that a movie has such, you know, longevity that, that yes. people still respond to this day. And joyfully, I mean, joyfully. Absolutely. Look, you know, it's interesting you say that because I think that, you know, if you want to be critically analytic, the film has certainly, as everything does, has its strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, but um, what I think really comes through and always did was that kind of um, exuberance and youthful joy and also sort of youthful, sometimes fantastical ideas about what fame <laughs> is and what success is and what it is to be an actor and a star, quote unquote, and I'm gonna live forever and yeah. Anyway, um, w but that's lovely. That's a celebration of that kind of period and that time in life for particularly people who lean towards an artistic uh, temperament. And, and um, so am I, so to answer your question, am I surprised? I guess um, I'm really gratified, but a part of me is not surprised because it so captures uh, uh, that, that feeling, that kind of exuberance, that youthful um, exuberance of life that some of us have cynically lost at times, at, at times. At times. Um, because one of the things that, you, you know, you're right. I mean, the movie is joyful. It's also- To me, but yeah, I'm interested in your take as well, please. It, it, it's joyful, it's heartbreaking. Mm. Um, it is, like you said, usefully sad with the way that, you know, you know we see the world but ultimately so hopeful. Yes. It, it, it has all of that where you can, it's not Pollyanna, but it's also not tragic. Right. Uh, it, it really, it is one of those things that you can feel it has an authenticity to it, a realness to it, but, but also in the end, it's just really hopeful. That's interesting you say that. I think that that's true um, in spite of some of the obviously unpleasant and difficult things that are addressed in the film. Um, and it, one of the things that occurs to me is it, it is kind of, I hope you don't mind my just thinking out loud, but it is kind of um, impressionistic in that sense, which is also kind of 
uh, a correlate to that time of youth where there's a lot of big feelings and big this and big that, and it's not quite all logical, but it's it captures a a sort of um, an essence of that kind of time and period for in in, in young people's lives. And um, I'm thrilled that you, that you talk about it as being hopeful. I think that's true. It's very interesting to me to say that because it was also sort of one of the last films of a former version of New York where, um, you know, uh, 42nd Street, b before the um, uh, gentrification, uh, in some ways, great improvement, but also, uh, you know, sort of disnification in a sense, we used to right. call it when I was living in New York, of, of 42nd Street. And there's a lot of great things. I don't mean to, there's a lot of great things, but it was sort of the last vestige of that grittier uh, sense of Manhattan anyway. Uh, at least from my experience living there for when I did. Um, so it's really interesting. I recently saw the film again with my kids. Uh, and um, it was, uh, I was surprised that I was surprised at how different, oh yeah, oh my God, what New York was back then. It was very, very interesting. So in, in the face of all that, or along with all of that earthiness, for lack of a better way of saying it, that's not quite the right word, but... Um, yeah, there was, there's, there's, there's a lot of joy in the film, in that environment. And so you went on from there to have a, a, a good, robust career. Tell us a little bit about, you've, you, you continued acting, you are a director. Tell us, you, people will remember you from ER, uh, yes. certainly. So tell us a little bit of, about kind of your career trajectory over, over the Sure. Sure, you know, as much as I can remember it. Um, uh, after the film, uh, there was some talk about, um, uh, well, when, the, when they were putting together the TV series and they met with a bunch of us, uh, with all of us at that time, uh, I, I, I think, you know, they did end up ha having the character in the show. I was not interested in playing, I hope I graciously said no thank you, um, because I wanted to work in the theater. I wanted to be, um, I knew that I was young and I really wanted to become a much better actor than I was. And to me, that was about the theater I was studying with Uta Hagen at the time. Um, and, um, and she was just great uh, for any actors out there. Anyway, um, so I worked primarily in New York theater and regional theater for the years uh, immediately after that. I did some film work, some television work, but it was mostly honestly to support my theater habit. And I was very fortunate to be able to do that. Um, at a certain point, I was working mostly in New York theater and um, broke and decided I needed to make some money. So I went out to California and again, very fortunately got some TV work, uh, which then ended it uh, up in, or not ended up, but eventually led to the role on ER that was a, uh, uh, you know, started as a recurring character that became, uh, or as a guest that became a recurring character that became a regular and um, had a great time on that show. It was a terrific environment to work with a great group of people. It was the biggest show on television that could have been filled with nightmare people because of that. And they were all just professional as could be. And, and it was um, gratifying and, and, and wonderful. Um, and that's where I started directing. And I started directing episodic television with ER. And for most of the past 18 years, I have been doing that primarily. I act when they let me and when I can fit it into my directing schedule generally. And you at least made one good foray into acting where you did win an Emmy Award. I did, yes. This was for a, a not, not universally loved show, a David Kelly show that I loved called Harry's Law with Kathy Bates, who's also an old friend. We lived in the same building in New York for uh, many years. Um, and um, uh, yeah, yeah. I was very um, grateful, uh, very, very uh, honored to be uh, nominated at all and to win is, is you know, uh, exciting and embarrassing at the same time. Uh, but, it, but it was very nice to be, to be given that. That was about... Um, I guess nine years ago, I think it was. And, uh, you know, my acting career ceased immediately thereafter. <laughs> um, and, um, but no, I've done a little bit of stuff now again, but primarily I've spent my time directing. Yeah. And how is that, how is that, how, how is that transition from acting to directing and? Well, it's, it's interesting. When I first started directing, I, I realized as I, I would tell friends that directing television was more similar to acting on stage in that you get a script and it's the, the first few days of prep are like the, the first week of rehearsal where 
you got the part, but then you realize, oh, I'm talentless and I don't know how, well, how, what I'm going to do and I have no ideas and I have no creativity and I've fooled everyone and now I'm in trouble. And you just feed in a lot of information and after a few days, it's like the second week of rehearsal where think ideas start to come and, and it starts to get put together and it kind of goes like that. And when you start shooting, unlike everyone else, um, you really don't get a second take metaphorically. You've got to get the work done. So it's like when the curtain's up on stage and you're in the middle of the play and, you know, if something goes wrong, you got to deal with it and keep going. And that's the way it is. And everybody else can say, sorry, can we go again? You can't right. as a director. <laughs> so it's a really good, the, the Carlet there, it's for an adrenaline junkie, which is what one has to be, I think, to be a theater actor as well. Um, it, it kind of is a very similar kind of thing. Over the years, it's, that's changed for me a bit. Um, I still get adrenalized, but I, I hopefully not as uh, quite as, uh, let's say, over adrenalized as I did in the very beginning. But yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. And it's all about storytelling. And, and I find, I hope that most actors enjoy working with me. I love working with actors. And um, I love designing shots. And I love working with actors because, um, you know, I'm fascinated by what's going on in, in there. Yeah. So <laughs> the more I can encourage people or, or hopefully set a tone that encourages them to explore that, the happier I am. Um, kind of coming back to, to fame a little bit. Yes, of course. I ask you about the song. Sure. Uh, so you wrote, is it okay if I call you mine? And you, yes. you wrote that actually before the movie, right? I did. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's part of the Fame soundtrack. And I did actually see a clip where you actually sang it again on Harry's Law. I did, yes. <laughs> uh, so I wrote that song when I was 16 and I actually auditioned with it uh, for Alan Parker, um, who at the time, the auditions were held in a, I think this was in a hotel room in New York. I can't remember. It might've been in an office in New York. Office, I think. And he had what was at the time a state-of-the-art video camera, which was basically the equivalent of a giant news <laughs> camera on his shoulder. And I was sitting six feet away from him across a room, maybe less, but across a little table like the one my computer's on right now. And he's just there with, look, with an eye closed looking this as I'm auditioning. It was a little bizarre. But, um, but I played the song in the audition. And then when I was uh, offered the role, uh, they sent me the script and the lyrics were in the script. And that's how I found out they wanted to use it in the film, which was... <laughs> was thrilling and, and really, really sweet. Um, and uh, yeah, when we were doing Harry's Law, a, a similar thing happened where, again, I just got a script and it was there. And I hadn't actually played the song in some time. I wasn't playing guitar much, but I had to work really hard in a week to try and work it up. And I did it in a different key and a different kind of voicing, but it was fun to revisit it. David Kelly is a kind of amazing, brilliant, crazy, wonderful uh, guy. And um, I have tremendous respect for him. and. Uh, uh, he just, I guess, decided to, th we're just going to throw that out there. I'll we'll deal with that. And I was like, okay, All right, great. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Right. And so as, as, the, as the person who wrote the song, I mean, it's a, what, it's a great song. Um, You're very kind. Thank you. And so kind of as people just kind of throw it into a script a couple of times, how do you react? I mean, what does that mean to you when people do that? It's just very sweet. Obviously, David was doing a nod and a wink with that, and oh. it was it was very, very, very sweet. I am, uh, uh, in addition to the um, the number of times in my life, uh, particularly earlier, but now still occasionally, when someone will say, "Hey, you know, that character helped me actually sort of own myself," and and uh, I was in a world where that wasn't accepted, and and my sexuality wasn't by no means was it celebrated it wasn't even it was even dangerous for me and that was something that made me feel like okay it's good help people I don't mean to overblow it it's just yeah. a character I played but that is one of the most gratifying things about it and the other one is the fact of how many people remember that song and um still come up to me and say that again I don't want to overblow it but it's very it's very very flattering um you know it this you know, you know it you know as, as we said Montgomery is a character that spoke to at least a lot of us at the time. And I think beyond that, because of what you said, um, you know, that it did help people. Mm. Uh, so we are having a, a drive-in to celebrate this. Like you said, we're, <laughs> we're inviting, um, we have some faculty and some students from some of the local performing arts schools. Oh, nice. Uh, coming, some local theater people. Mm -hmm. and, you know, as- Where are you doing it, by the way? Where, where, where are you having it? It's at the um, 
Spring Cinema and Tap House, they created, because the theaters were all closed, um, right. created a big drive-in in their parking lot. That, Where is that? What part, what part of Atlanta is that? Where it is, is um, in Sandy Springs. Okay. Okay. Good. Right. Right. I've worked. I worked. I, I worked. I, I produced for a year and directed a bunch of episodes of Star and have worked in a, and the resident down in Atlanta. A lot of a number of shows that are shot in Atlanta. Okay. So yeah. I've gotten the opportunity to get to know the city a little bit. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. It's just a little bit north. Just a little mm -hmm. bit north. Um, but you know, as as people we're, we're going to be watching this, what is something that you would hope that afterward that people walk away with? after experiencing some of us for the hundredth time, some for the first time, kind of what, what would you hope that people would walk away with? That's a really interesting question. I don't know what I would, I, uh, <laughs> let me give you something you can use because the simple truth is that, um, well, to be honest, I believe people should walk away with whatever they take from something. And the, the, the courage that I try to embrace and that, I hope this doesn't sound pretentious, but I, I think that uh, anyone who wants to be an artist of any kind um, has to come to terms with the audience and that there are four possibilities and three of them involve pain. The audience won't like it and I won't like it. They'll like it and I won't like it. I'll like it and they won't like it or both of us likes it. That's the only one that doesn't involve much pain um, or any pain. So, so once one comes to terms with that, it's really about trying to do the best you can to be as honest as you can and as skilled as you can, and then let people respond how they will. Uh, uh, there was a great actor named Barnard Hughes, who I got the privilege to work with in a production of The Iceman Cometh back in the 80s. Uh, and one of the things he used to say is you have to go out and love the audience. You have to love them in the way that lets them, as you would anyone else, you love them, you let them respond however they will. To anything you do. That's the per permission you have to give them. So, sorry to get so philosophical about it all, but the truth is, I just, I, I, I hope that people um, have some reaction to it, whatever it is, and, and they should, uh, uh, should be free to have whatever that reaction is. I think that's a great way to approach it, especially for a lot of theater people. Uh, I, I will say we do the same thing. We show movies and you know, we try to bring LGBTQ cinema, yes. um, independent filmmakers, and we have the same reactions. We'll like it, they won't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, honestly, it's maybe not just art. I think right. it's any endeavor in life. Right. One has to, at a certain point, come to terms that you can't please everyone and people will respond and react how they will. And we can't try, and, I think we get in trouble when we try to manipulate that. At least I have every time in my life I've tried to manipulate that, <laughs> certainly in relationships and certainly in my work. So. And we all hope that we have a great experience, but letting people have their own experience. And that's kind of what yes. we've learned over the years too, because I've I bet. seen things and I'm like, I love this movie. People are like, what were you thinking? I'm like, because you were great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's it. That's what it yeah, is. So, I mean, it's... So I will say, um, you, you know, Paul, I'm really grateful that you took the time um, to My do pleasure. this with me this afternoon. Uh, we are really excited to show fame. I hope that people have a great experience with it. I hope, I hope so. all of these characters in whatever way or shape or form speak to somebody in the audience in a profound way, the way that Montgomery spoke to a lot of us 40 years ago. So I thank you for the performance and thank you really for taking the time to join us today to talk about it. It's my sincere pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me and I, I hope everybody enjoys watching the film. And thank you everybody for joining us for this conversation with Paul McCrane and I hope to see you at the drive-in for fame. Thank you all very much.